We started this project in late 2008-2009, and one of the unanticipated benefits was the community that, that we built. Um, thinking that we were really just starting to grow more of our own food, collect more water, create less waste, build some soil, you know, create more of an ecosystem. Um, that's what we were focused on, especially as engineers, the tangible things. And it's really the intangible benefits that have um, really shined through. I have a friend who said this to me right from the beginning, which was that for every dollar he had in the bank account, he had a thousand invested in community. And after five years, I can say we probably have 10,000 invested in community for every dollar we have in the bank. And that's where true resilience and, and change comes from, is that, is that community connection. So I have to be honest, after I took my PDC, I mean, I'm just an engineer um, with very little horticultural experience. I didn't really believe a lot of the stuff that I learned about. And um, especially when we got back and we started working on this project, this is what we started with. I mean, it's like, it's concrete, basically. It's very hard, I, like, I really have to put a lot of force into that to break it apart. And so we've really done about three things to turn this into this. I mean, this is what we're producing now. This is what comes out of the garden. We just refreshed the swale um, in our garden bed and we sifted this out of the, out of the swales. Um, so number one, we're harvesting water. And there's a saying that you can kind of keep in the back of your mind, blue, green, and brown. So blue stands for water. Green stands for the plants, and brown stands for carbon. And it's the soil carbon that we've added into this soil that's created this structure. So we got the water piece right. The second thing that we do is we add lots of mulch to the garden. And so the mulch keeps the top layer of the soil cool, and it allows all those little bugs to come up and process that mulch into um, a microbially beneficial environment. And the third thing that we do is we add lots of compost. So all of the organics that go through our, our house end up going through a compost cycle. And then that compost goes onto the surface of the soil, both in the front yard and in the backyard. And like I said, I didn't believe that it was gonna be able to turn this into this. But in five years, we've now got some of the most amazing topsoil. We recently had the topsoil tested from a soil food web lab and the lab technician called us up and was so excited um, and stated that we had one of the best garden soils that she'd ever seen. And the repercussions to that are nutrient dense food. I mean, even just like the water holding capacity of the soil has gone up exponentially, which means we need to add, well, we don't add any water, but we have like the plants just look better and better every single year. And taste, the, the food tastes so amazing coming out of this system. And if that wasn't enough, the other thing that we've noticed is pest interaction has actually gone down because the plants are healthier. Our solar hot water panels provide over 80% of our hot water throughout the year. And it's just great being able to take a shower and know that that, that heat came from the sun. It's called an evacuated tube solar collector. Standing outside of the passive solar greenhouse that we built about four years ago, uh, part of the constraint of growing in Calgary is we've got a short summer, about 100 frost free days. We've got extreme hail, so anything from nickel all the way up to loony or toony size, so quite large. And uh, we, want to make sure that we, we wanted to make sure that we always had a crop coming off of this space. And so despite the fact that it's only 20 square meters or about 200 square feet, we actually get about the same amount of productivity out of this greenhouse as we do in the whole back garden. And that's because we're able to maintain perfect growing conditions all season long. So the greenhouse doesn't drop below 12 degrees Celsius at night all season long. Um, 
And with the solar powered vents up there, which open up automatically, uh, without electricity actually, uh, the greenhouse actually maintains a really amazing growing condition inside. So we try and keep it below 28, 26 to 28 degrees Celsius during the day. The polycarbonate uh, is what forms the front surface. We have a lot of sun coming in this ecosystem. So we really only want to harvest the sun out of one surface. All of the other surfaces are insulated. And uh, the polycarbonate's really nice because it actually splits the light up. So the plants really love light when the, when the, the light spectrum gets split up. In the bottom here, we have seasonally removable plugs that we can take out, which allows additional ventilation through the actual greenhouse itself. And this really increases that thermal siphon going through the space up to those upper vents. The greenhouse is actually insulated better than most North American homes. And while it was expensive to build, If you imagine each one of these spaces, or one of these spaces getting built at the same time as a house goes in, the incremental cost to put in one of these would not be that high. Okay. And we could dramatically impact food security issues that we have in North America if all of us just took okay. a little bit of effort to grow some food in, in an all year round mm -hmm. greenhouse like this. Mm -hmm. So the crops that we grow in here include tomatoes, microgreens, um, greens in general, uh, squash, and you can even push the boundaries a little bit, even in our climate, we can grow things like figs and olives and pomegranates if you get the design right. One of the things you'll notice about the greenhouse is the steep angle at which we've got the glazing. So there's really two things that that accomplishes. Number one, with our snow, um, the steep angle allows the snow to automatically uh, fall off of the glazing, so we don't have to come out here and sweep it off. And number two, because it doesn't hold the snow, we don't actually have to go with really large support members to, to hold the glazing up. So it makes the structural design a lot simpler. Um, because we're using polycarbonate though, if we wanted to, in future greenhouses, we might, if we have a larger space, we might actually choose to go with a shallower angle, which will make it a little bit more ergonomic at the front of the greenhouse. In order to get through the winter, we had to come up with some way to passively and actively heat the greenhouse. So this is a rocket mass heater, which fits into the back side of the greenhouse. It's uh, two metric tons of mass made out of cobs, so that's clay, sand, with a little bit of straw to, just to hold it together. And uh, this rocket can actually, mostly just burns waste wood, uh, but we're just working on a project right now where we're gonna actually convert this rocket mass heater to start burning waste pellet fuel, which we have a lot of in the area. I'm really a big fan of, of rocket mass heaters for lots of reasons. One, they're really inexpensive to build. So this costs us around $200 in materials to put this together. The uh, material for the cob itself actually comes from an excavation from a house just down the road. So it's a, as indigenous as a material as you can get. And there's lots of sand on the prairie. Um, this little drum right here comes from a local auto shop. And then inside of the drum, there's actually two steel pipes, um, which we have a lot of being that it's Alberta, there's lots of oil field activity here. So that's scrap pipe. And the rocket itself uh, is kind of a unique design because it actually uh, is, consists of a, a combustion chamber that's horizontal, made out of refractory brick. So the idea behind it is that we want to create the hottest possible combustion temperature that we can. And by doing that, we get a really clean, clean combustion of the wood that, that is moving through the system. Mm -hmm. Only once the combustion is complete do we actually start extracting energy from the exhaust. So this barrel gets pretty smoking hot when this thing's running and this is kind of the quick heat. Okay. So when we light this thing up, this is the first thing to actually start having heat come off of it. Um, and then we pick it up in a manifold um, and run it through a duct all the way through the actual bench itself. And so over the course of about a three hour burn, this bench will get up to about 30, 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and so there's a lot of energy stored up in this mass, this two metric tons of mass, which will slowly release that energy back into the greenhouse through the course of the night to make sure that the greenhouse itself doesn't drop below about five degrees Celsius. Looking back on the last five years, I think one of the most profound things that I've learned is that we all have an impact. Every single one of us, every species on this planet, every plant, every microbe has an impact. 
It's, I mean, Newton figured that out for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We can't stop that. But what we can do is optimize whether our impact is positive, neutral, or negative. And a lot of us just read the news on a daily basis and kind of stop at this idea that humans at best can be neutral. What permaculture showed me though is that we can be just as positive as we are negative. And part of the way that we do that is by building community. And this element right here that I'm standing in front of, this cob oven, is a perfect example of this. This is one of the first things that we put in to our landscape, into our project. And it has cooked thousands of pizzas, it's created hundreds if not thousands of relationships, and it has really helped to catalyze a community in this outdoor space. And going forward, all of my designs now really emphasize the importance of building that community space into the permaculture landscape, whether it's large or small. So when you're going out and doing design, when you're creating space for people, for ecologies, always keep this little piece of information in, in your mind. It has to taste better, it has to be more fun, and it has to be far more inspiring. That's the only way that we're going to actually catalyze change and make a better world.